Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. And we are really happy to be here. Hi, Lane. Hi, welcome everybody. So Seed Talk is the sister podcast to the Field and Garden podcast, both sponsored by thegardenersworkshop.com. And today we have a really special greatly timed topic and a really wonderful guest who has become a good friend and who I consider to be the expert in the Amaryllis Growing Department, Val Shermer. Hi, Val. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Lane. I'm glad to be here. Hi. Thank you, Val. Thanks for joining us. And so Lane has lined up a bunch of questions so we can kind of pick Val's brain about everything Amaryllis. And we're just so pleased to have her here today. You know, Val is the instructor of our online course on what's the, tell me, say the full name, Val. Forcing Glorious Blooms for the Holidays and Beyond. And it is a dynamite course. And when it means, when she says the holidays and beyond, that means that there are some that can be forced during the holiday Christmas season. And then we're talking about that long, dark winter after the holidays. And so we're just honored to have Val here to kind of share information um, that'll just bring all of those facts a little bit clear. All right, Lane, take us away. All right. So yes, we are going to be talking about amaryllis today. And I just want to say to start off with, we're talking about a group of plants in the genus Hippiastrum. So this group of plants used to be classified in the Amaryllis genus. There was a lot of debate over how they should be named. And back in 1987, they decided they were going to be separated out into the Hippiastrum genus. That is what we're talking about today. They're still referred to commonly as Amaryllis, and we will be calling them Amaryllis throughout this podcast. So Amaryllis, many people consider it to be the queen of bulbs. And like Lisa said, we are joined here today by Val Shermer, who is the queen of beautiful bulb arrangements. So Val, can you introduce yourself to everyone and tell us about your background and also why you love Amaryllis so much? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I'm Val Shermer and I have a uh, specially cut flower farm called Three Toads Farm. And uh, I love forcing bulbs. And so that has been our claim to fame from the very beginning when we started out with lilies. Uh, You know, the bigger the bulb, the bigger the show. And so when we talk about amaryllis, it's the same thing. Bigger the bulb, the bigger the show. And they, like you said, they are queens. They are queens of indoor flowers in the winter. Yep. Yep. And I thought this would be a really good timing for this episode. This is going to be airing mid-December. So I know there are a lot of people that have amaryllis growing indoors right now. Maybe they've already started blooming. Maybe they're about to finish blooming or maybe they're about to bloom. And people are wondering, how do I take care of it? What do I do after it blooms? And also, as we get deeper into the holiday season, this can be a great time to pick up some bulbs at discounted prices to add to your collection. And of course, amaryllis make a great holiday gift. So shall we get started? Sounds good. Sounds great. All right. So the very first question. So there's a lot of talk about forcing these bulbs indoors. What do we actually mean when we're talking about forcing a bulb? Forcing simply means that you're getting the bulb to bloom before it would naturally bloom you know, in the outdoors in its own habitat. So that means you'd be taking an amaryllis like this that would normally be blooming outdoors um, where it's perennial in the summertime and you're getting it to start blooming now. So that's what forcing means. Exactly. All right. So what size of amaryllis bulbs do you prefer to buy and why? Because when it comes to bulbs, bigger is better. Is that right, Val? Yes, it is. (laughs) Uh, The bulbs that I prefer to buy are just like this giant. And this is size 36 to 38 centimeters. And um, the reason that you go after the great big bulbs is because the blooms are already in the bulb. So the bigger the bulb means you're gonna get more stems and you're gonna get more blooms and there'll be bigger blooms. Yes, Lisa, is that also the size you would tend to buy? I know you used to sell some amaryllis via the store. 
Is that the size? Yes. That we yeah. We also like Val always shot as a minimum to get 36 centimeters. We love getting forties, but they are not nearly as available. And I also wanted to say that we didn't mention this when we started. If, if you're listening to this on a podcast, Cast app. If you hop over to YouTube, you can actually see us. And Val is sitting amongst Amaryllis, as well as she's showing off some of these really big bulbs. Um, <laughs> Val is flanked by Amaryllis right now. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty dadgum beautiful. I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> no, I'm so glad that you did. And you know, Val, that's really a great way for people to think about it. When you look at the bulb, the flowers are already in there. And sometimes when you see, I just saw some at the store. I just got back from the store a few minutes ago and they had amaryllis in a little box and they were so small. And it's like, how disappointing for people when they see these in magazines and online, these big, beautiful blooms. And that's not what's coming out of those small bulbs, right? Right, right. And so what I would recommend to people when they see them, uh, you can be an opportunist. I mean, you could go ahead and buy them, but you're going to need just, you're going to have to buy more to fill up your containers and get that exciting right. show um, if you're getting a smaller bulb. And I will get size 34, 36s, but it's got to be, you know, something that I can't get any other way. It's new to the market. It's the first time they've been able to have them that size. But, you know, I, I go after the great big bulbs, just like Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you are saving them, if you give them the proper conditions, you can grow those bulbs bigger over time too. So we will talk about that over the course of this podcast. So what are your favorite varieties of amaryllis to grow and are amaryllis fragrant? So with paper whites, which is another commonly forced bulb, fragrance can be an issue because a lot of people don't like that fragrance. Are there any fragrance issues with amaryllis and what are your favorite varieties to grow? There really aren't any kind of fragrant fragrance issues with amaryllis at all. Most of the, like these that I have um, right here for anybody that's watching, uh, they don't have any fragrance. If it would be anything, it might be just the fragrance of freshness. There mm -hmm. are some varieties that are said to be lightly fragrant, but it's, it's, you know, it's really, it's really not there. It's not like a paper white issue where, you know, the common paper whites are, can be really overpowering. Yes. And my favorite varieties. Um, <laughs> it's hard to pick. Hard to pick. It's like picking pansies or picking dahlias or something. I mean, you love the one that is making you happy right then. Um, I like uh, for anybody's watching here. One of these. One of these amaryllis is a single. This one, and then this one is a double. And wow. so a lot of times I will go for the doubles because they kind of, some of them even look like peonies, which is really exciting. But then I would get a single like this one, which is Bolero, uh, because this fuchsia color is so vibrant and it's perfect to have during the winter. So I can't really say, you know, this one is absolutely my very favorite of all time. So yeah. basically Val's saying she loves the one she's with. Yes. <laughs> yes. Lisa, That's do you have me. a favorite? No. I mean, <laughs> I really, really, I'm like you. It's like they're all so spectacular when they bloom. And I still remember the, the garden that I bought from you online and had it shipped to my mother-in-law, which had three huge bulbs in it. And they were white with the green throats. I mean, mm -hmm. the woman stood and gazed at those blooms all day, all, every day. I mean, they're just, and they were just white and green. I mean, they were fabulous. So I love yeah. them all. I do too. No favorites. I love, I love great big, I like a big show. And so again, if you're, you know, if you're getting a big bulb, you're going to get a great show regardless of what variety it is. Yes. And something I do like to keep in mind when you're picking a variety is to consider the time of year that it's going to be blooming, 
not yes. just this year, but maybe in the future, because I definitely save my bulbs. So maybe the first year I buy them, I'll have them bloom at Christmas time. But then the following year, it might be February. So I try to think of what color would I want to see indoors at that time? It might be the whites or pinks, or maybe you do want a really bright color. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you're shopping. Good point. So how long does an amaryllis bulb typically take to go from planting to blooming? And when should I plant if I wanted to have blooms, for example, for Christmas? And this can depend on the variety that you're growing. It can depend on environmental conditions, like is it warmer or cooler where you're growing it indoors? And something that is not as obvious is it might depend on the hemisphere that your bulb was actually grown in. Lane, these are really great questions. I appreciate how much time you've taken to put together really good ones. Because oh, an, am welcome. an amaryllis bulb um, that is a dormant bulb, like the one I keep showing, this great big one that happens to have come from Holland, they can take six, eight weeks to start blooming or even to break dormancy. Because the thing to remember is that amaryllis that are naturally blooming where they would naturally grow, which is where it's really warm, like Florida or Texas would bloom in the summertime. So we want to get them to bloom, you know, in the winter. So this, this big old bulb from Holland, you know, it's going to be hard to kind of wake this one up, but it would be blooming, you know, probably February, which would be a super time to have it. The, uh, the bulbs that are from the Southern hemisphere, such as the ones that we are, you can see here, um, were actually um, potted up. I always write down the dates on everything. And so I got them and they were potted up in October, late October. And so they, they you can force them much more quickly uh, and they will definitely bloom for the holidays. So if somebody's looking for a bulb from the Southern hemisphere, you might not see, you know, this bulb is from Peru, which is, I get Peruvian bulbs, but they might be called Christmas flowering. And that would mean they're from the Southern hemisphere. Northern hemisphere is going to take, you know, six to eight weeks. You can pretty much count on that. Once in a while, you'll get one that wants to bloom sooner. You'll get one that wants to wait and bloom a little bit later. But um, the Southern hemisphere bulbs they think it's already summer. So, and they have been held. I mean, they think it's July. So they are really itching to start growing. Um, you should be seeing growth. If you have a Southern Hemisphere bulb, you should be seeing growth within a week or two easily. And these, I tend to grow these a little bit slower because I kind of like them a little bit shorter also. So I keep them a little cooler. Um, and so this one has been growing since the end of October and it's already starting to bloom. And the other thing about getting great big bulbs is that you're gonna get multiple stems. And so if you see one that's already starting to bloom, don't disregard it as it's gonna be a one and done because a big bulb, like what we were talking about, will send up three stems. Oftentimes it'll send up four stems. So it will be blooming for you know, a couple months. Yes. Okay. That was a really pleasant surprise with bulbs that I got from you is like, you know, she, I can remember the day she called me and said, you won't believe it. There's another bud. I had set them out in the garage, you know? So yes, bigger is definitely better. I mean, the more we're talking about it, I'm being reminded of all the better parts of it. <laughs> yes. And we're recording this in early December, just to give everyone a frame of reference. Yes. Of the timing. Okay. Next question. So let's say you have your bulbs, you've already picked them, you've already gotten them. So are there any special tips to help wake these dormant bulbs up prior to planting? And I'm referring to a little bit of a soak for their roots. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the thing to keep in mind with amaryllis is that they love warmth. They love it. And that's what wakes them up and gets them to start blooming. And so what I recommend is that people get their bulbs and then they take an extra step. And when you get them, put them in a, um, in any kind of a dish with a little bit of water. And I, I like to sprinkle in a little bit of like miracle Grow, 
miracle Grow for tomatoes, for example, just a little pinch and let that bulb um, sit in that little bit of water. And I'm talking about a quarter of an inch of water. You don't want them sitting in two inches of water, but put the roots in it too. And that will soften them up and kind of wake them up. And then what you would do after letting them sit overnight in a warm spot in warm water is to plant that bulb and um, put it someplace warm. So if you have a south facing window that in the winter time gets you know sun coming in, that's a good spot. If you have an old house like we do, you could actually sit um, your pot on the floor register and it would like that heat coming up too. Mm. Just put it in the warmest place that you have in your home and um, it will it will help it wake up much quicker. So let's talk about containers. I know Val, you have beautiful pots and containers that make everyone jealous, but what type of containers can I grow amaryllis in? And does that pot or vessel need to have holes? And how big does it need to be? Because amaryllis actually do like to be a little bit snug in their pots. Yes, that's true. They like to be, I mean, you don't want to put an amaryllis in a great big pot and there it is right in the middle. It won't look very pretty and it's not going to be very happy. And so um, if you have clay pots, if you have something left over, you could pick up one, you could get a six inch pot. And that if you have a big amaryllis, that's going to be the ideal uh, size. Um, I plant mine, the Peruvian ones all get planted up as soon as they come in in six inch plastic pots. And the reason I use plastic is because I intend to transplant them. So even yeah. if it's a plastic pot, I'm not considering that for the final show. Unless you happen to have a container, like some kind of a really pretty thing that you can just slip the six inch pot down into it and then it can stay in the six inch pot. You asked me about, um, do they have to have drainage holes or not? You yes. can do either one. But the thing to keep in mind is if you put it in something that doesn't have a drainage hole, you don't want to overwater it, which people can tend to do because this is a bulb that we're talking about. And a bulb that sits in water is going to rot. So you want to make yeah. sure that you don't overwater it. If you have a clay pot that has a drainage hole in the bottom, I always put a coffee filter over that hole. So all of your dirt doesn't just fall out. And, um, and if you're planting it that way, you don't have to really worry about overwatering it very much. But another trick is when you first plant it, give it a good drink of warm water, make sure the soil is moist, then set it in that really warm spot and don't water it again until it starts growing. Yes, oh, that's a good and we tip. actually will, we will talk about watering too, but okay. that's a really good tip. Okay, great. let's move on. And great point about if your container or pot doesn't have holes, you just have to be really vigilant not to overwater, not to let that bulb sit. You don't want it sitting in water and rotting. Right. And I forgot to mention one other thing when we talked about containers, mm -hmm. use a container that's heavy enough to be able to su support the amaryllis because when it sends up these stems, with the flowers on top, if it's a lightweight container, it's going to topple over. Oh, that's a really good point. Lisa, do you have any favorite containers that you like to use? Yes. And I want to say, I hope everybody else caught that kind of tip that I think people don't realize is that Val said that she was going to transplant them. And that's something that a lot of people, you can buy even at the store an amaryllis that's already started or buy multiples yeah. and bring it home and transplant them into some gorgeous container to grow on. I mean, you can literally have an instant garden, right, Val? Um, but I love, um, Val, what do you call the pedestal containers? Is that what they're called? Big like an urn? An urn. Yeah, like an urn or a compote. Yes. 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 I mean, good. urns. I have one particular urn that three jumbos fit in. It's yeah. super heavy. It's just, and oh my goodness. And when I finish it off with moss, the way that Val taught us how to do it in her course, I mean, it is spectacular. It, it really is. Uh, one of my favorite containers is an old punch bowl that I got mm -hmm. at an antique store. And it is, um, you would never use punch in it because it's, uh, 
it's, it's, I don't know, it's silver plated, but that's kind of worn out on the inside, but it is fabulous to be, you know, chock full of amaryllis or paper whites. And I mean, that's just a great idea to peruse antique and thrift stores for containers that of dish of, of serving dishes from the days gone by that you don't know if they have lead or whatever on them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of times the more roughed up the container looks, it actually looks prettier. Yes. I yes, think it does exactly. Too. Exactly. All right. I'm ready to plant some. <laughs> <laughs> I know. All right. So let's talk about soil. So what type of soil mix or other media should someone use when they're potting this amaryllis up? And do you like to leave the soil bare or do you like to top it with something? And I know the answer to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> And how deep should someone plant an amaryllis bulb? Um, on the type of soil, the one thing I want to say is never, ever dig up soil from outside and use that because you will have a whole new set of friends in your home. <laughs> so don't you know, buy uh, potting soil. If you buy it from a big box store, make you know, get it that get one that's great for containers too because it'll have all the ingredients so that, that soil stays light and fluffy and that it will drain really well. I use a variety called ProMix, um, yeah. which I use that for every single thing I plant, whether it's big containers outside, starting seeds, amaryllis, everything, spring bulbs. So a ProMix is my, is my favorite. Let me see one thing about that too. We had a customer recently that reached out and said they had been storing a bunch of soil outdoors and they went to go make their soil blocks and there were ants infested in it. So if you have soil, make sure it's kind of clean or you've been storing it somewhere, maybe indoors, not out on the side of your house in the yard where there are going to be a bunch of bugs that have made it their home. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really good, that's a really good tip. And then when you talked about how deep to plant the amaryllis, I think yeah. amaryllis like to have about half of their bulb a half to a third of the bulb out of the soil. I don't know why, but they do not want to be planted like a daffodil or something that's, you know, inches down in the soil. They like to have part of this bulb out of the soil. So don't bury it too deeply and, um, and leaving the soil bare. I leave the soil bare when it's in the six inch pot but at the minute that I transplant it into something, I'm going to cover it with moss. Uh, I like Spanish moss. I like living clump moss. Uh, I like uh, reindeer moss. And it also looks really good if you even say you've got some magnolias, magnolia tree, you can yeah. cut off little pieces of leaf and you can stick that around it too. So it's almost got like a, a wreath around the pot. Oh. That looks good. Oh, that's a good idea. So pretty. And when you cover it with moss, do you water right through the moss or do you try to lift up some of it and water? How do you deal with that? What I do with watering is because you don't want to overwater, period, or else you're going to get, you know, soil gnats, those fungus gnats that come out of the air, I think. Um, so I always stick my finger. I tell people, stick your finger down in the side of your pot. And if all the way up to like your second knuckle, if it's dry, then just pour in water. And I've just poured in one place on the pot. I don't sprinkle it around on anything. I pour it in one spot because that water will, you know, move its way through the soil and it'll, you know, you don't have to water it all, all the way around the pot, water in one place. And I don't, if I have Spanish moss, I will uh, pick that up and then water in that one spot because sometimes Spanish moss will lose its great color if it gets wet. Okay, great tip there. All right, so speaking of watering, which you just did, so how often should someone water their amaryllis before and after they see growth? So you've already kind of talked about this, but let's just reiterate. So let's say someone has just potted up their amaryllis you don't want them to be watering constantly before they see growth or they might actually rot the bulb. So can you talk about that and then reiterate after they start to see growth, what they should do? Sure. Yep. It's hard for people to hold back and not overwater sometimes when they first start an amaryllis, if they're, especially when they're not experienced with growing them. 
But uh, amaryllis bulbs are kind of like dahlia tubers where you don't want to overwater them until you start seeing growth. And then they'll also start sending down roots because the bulb or the tuber can't do anything with the water. And so it will just rot and you don't want to see that happen. Um, so yeah. don't let it get, you know, bone dry, crispy, but they can, when you plant a new amaryllis, give it a good drink of warm water, put it in that warm spot, and you're not going to probably water it again for two weeks. So well, then that's good to know. yeah, don't, um, yeah, just don't, don't overwater. It's better that they're a little on the dry side than on the too wet side. And then once I, um, once it starts growing, then you just want to water it enough so that it, it's, it, the soil dries out. And so that when you stick your finger down up to your second knuckle, that you want that to be able to dry out over time. So like the bulb gardens that I'm potting up right now, I, um, tell people they were not going to have to water for at least a week and a half, at least. Perfect. And I think it's also a really good tip, like you mentioned, to use warm water because these are plants that like tropical conditions. You don't want to shock them by giving them a drink of really cold water. Yeah. <laughs> They'll make their toes curl up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Next question. Let's talk about fertilizer. So should someone fertilize their amaryllis? And if so, when should they start? How often? And what type of fertilizer do you recommend? And you did already mention including just a pinch of something in the soaking water initially, but go yeah. ahead with that. Yeah. Um, amaryllis are bulbs and all bulbs do not need to be fertilized when you plant them because they've got everything they need to grow a beautiful bloom or lots of blooms already inside that bulb. Um, and so I wouldn't, I don't, I don't fertilize my amaryllis at all until summertime, like next summer, when I move all the amaryllis outside when it's warm, like really warm. And then I will, uh, water them when they're dry and I fertilize them whenever I'm fertilizing something else. Uh, so if I'm fertilizing my tomatoes, I would give the amaryllis a shot of that fertilizer. miracle Grow for tomatoes is fine. You don't have to fertilize them with, you know, some of the special things that are like a, a blooming, a rooting and blooming because they're not blooming then. So just any kind of a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, a balanced fertilizer is all you need. So Perfect. just a general purpose. Yes. So let's talk about location inside your house. So where should we locate our amaryllis and what conditions should we provide prior to it breaking dormancy? And then once it's growing and once it's flowering. Yep. Yep. So to get them to break dormancy, you want them to have plenty of warmth. And by warmth, I'm talking 80 degrees, you know, maybe even 85 if you have that kind of a warm spot. So uh, a room that has south facing windows, just put it right there. Um, and that will help them break dormancy. Then I would leave mine there until they are growing and they're starting to set buds. And mm -hmm. at that point, they don't need to be in the sun at all. And so I would I put it wherever I would see it and enjoy it the most. And you want it to be in a, you know, in a warm room. Um, for us, it's in the kitchen a lot of times on the island because we have the overhead lights and that's a warm spot. You know, the kitchens are the heart of your home. Oftentimes is where people yeah. gather. It's so much fun to have them there. If somebody puts them in a room that um, uh, doesn't have overhead light, but you've got a window like, you know, over on the other side of the rooms, as amaryllis start to grow, they will lean toward that light. And so if that's the condition you've got, it's fine. But every day or so, you want to give that pot a turn so that it it straightens itself up. It doesn't just keep leaning, 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 but you, know, you just turn it around. And you predicted the next question, Val. So <laughs> let's talk about troubleshooting. One of the main issues I think people have, you just alluded to, which is how can I keep my amaryllis flower stalk straight? So amaryllis 
are phototropic, which means that side of the stalk that's away from the light, those cells are actually going to elongate and that side of the stalk is going to become longer than the other side, which has the effect of making that stalk bend towards the light. And like you mentioned, when there's a very directional light source, like a window or something, that effect is magnified and it can be very difficult to actually keep that stalk straight. So can you just describe how someone can keep their stalk straight? That is an excellent description that you just gave. Oh. That's so that people understand why they're they're. I mean, that was Lane. That is spot on. Um, so one thing is just to keep them turning, you know, and that will keep them straight. I don't. Um, I don't provide support for my amaryllis. Sometimes people will. Um, I've seen where they go and they cut some branches and then they they put them around the amaryllis and then tie it up at the top, almost like a teepee, which is so yeah. pretty to do something like that. And then that yeah. gives them support as they grow. I find that if you're giving them a uh, light indoors, like on your countertop and that you've got the overhead lights on that um, they're not going to typically get really, really tall and lanky, but they might. And if that's the case, and we can talk about what to do if one of them like falls over, because that's not. Bad. Oh, yes, we will. We will actually talk okay. about that. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. And something I've noticed, too, is it's really important, like Val just said, to try to rotate it a quarter turn every day because you will think it's going fine. There have been some times where I'm like, oh, the it's totally straight. I don't need to rotate it today. And then you come back two days later and it's totally curved. <laughs> so just make sure you preemptively rotate that a quarter turn every day. Lisa, do you have any tips for that or experience with that? Yeah, I am. I'm one of those people that TPs because I have such a low light in my house. You know, I mean, even with overhead lights. Um, so, yeah, that's we have, we kind of preemptive do that from the get go to build our little stay um, stems. And we oftentimes will use our saucer magnolia um, stems mm -hmm. here and they look really pretty with their little fuzzy buds on them. And, um, mm -hmm. and then we could even just string a ribbon or just raffia around that if it's needed. Um, and sometimes I have found that when we do that and you give them that kind of support at the hip, and when I say the hip, I mean like at the eight inch or so height on the stem, then they'll just, because they get really tall and low light. And um, so we've pushed those limits. So I wished I had enough light to just turn it every quarter. Um, but that works really well. That was a great tip. And let's talk about it getting tall too, because I liked Val's comment earlier about keeping the temperature a little cooler to help the height yes. stay shorter. So my flower stalk is getting so tall and top heavy that it's flopping over. Any tips to help prevent this or remedy it? Yes. Um, I, and I, and I have a, a friend that actually what she did when hers got really tall and flopped over, because, you know, it will break, it will break the stem because these are hollow stems. And so it can, it can break them. But what she did because it was totally flopped over like 90 degrees angle and she braced it back up. Um, what I do is if one flops over, I get to use it as a cut flower and yes. amaryllis flowers last as long as a cut flower, even longer than they do actually on the bulb. And so that's another reason why I like to plant at least three of them together, because if I've got one that kind of flops over or even maybe they're just too crowded because they have so many blooms and they're kind of all jammed in there, I'll just cut off one of these stems right above the bulb and then I'll cut it down to fit whatever vase I want. Mm -hmm. And like they look fabulous in a vase with magnolia um, leaves in it maybe some uh, Nandina in it, and then stick in a couple of amaryllis. Yes. So you, again, Val, you have predicted the next question. Oh. So can you use amaryllis as cut flowers? Yes, of course you can. And mm -hmm. if someone wants to specifically harvest an amaryllis, what stage should they harvest it at? And you just said it has a very long base life, but any other yes, it does. information about that? Yeah, people that grow amaryllis for as cut flowers 
um, and then send them to florists. They, the florists will get them when all of the buds are shut. And that's because they don't get damaged on the way you know, to the florist. Mm -hmm. Uh, they will continue to open up. I would, I don't think the stage that you would cut it is that important. Um, I would cut it when some of the, you know, it's first starting to open and then you've got other bloom buds too. And yeah. another thing is if you've got like, I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll have like six blooms on top of a stem, which is really crowded. And so what I'll do is I'll take one of those blooms and just snap it off and I'll put it oh. in, in a little, um, a little vase, like a little, even it could be a shot glass, or it can also float. If you've got those floaters, you know, you can put the stem through that and then, um, you can use that throughout your house too. Oh, uh, that's really pretty. And you'll you never you have... miss any of them. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, we have definitely done that. We used to have those little cork floaties that she's talking yeah. about. Yeah. And yes, I mean, there is nothing more beautiful than a floating amaryllis bud, but we too cut them for cut flowers. They're very sought after cut flowers actually, mm -hmm. but, and because of the cost of the bulbs and just, there's just, they're just not readily available and to grow your own for your own home. I mean, a vase, a tall cylinder, with three amaryllis or even one amaryllis with a little bit of foliage on your mantle is like, yeah. that is like over the top. Amazing. Um, so yeah, yeah, cut flowers are just, just the best. Yeah. All right. So how long does amaryllis typically bloom indoors? And again, this can vary based on a lot of things, but in general, how much time can you expect them to be blooming for? And that is a great question because I always tend to um, err on the side of them not blooming as long. So when I say, you know, they'll bloom six weeks easy if you have a big bulb, because it will, uh, mm -hmm. for anybody that can see here, like on this particular one, I've got one blooming stock. I've got a, another one that's just coming up. And then down here, I've got another one just peeking up. And if it's oh. in four, that show is going to go on for two months. And if I say yeah. two months, then I always have people saying, well, mine lasted longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also a good idea to maybe have some different varieties going and yes. having multiple bulbs in the same container, just that helps to extend the bloom time. And also you could stagger the time that you're actually potting these up. So you can really get a very long season of amaryllis blooms in your house if you have multiple containers going. Yep. The ones that I'm shipping right now that are dormant bulbs, because that's all I'll ship is the dormant bulb garden. Um, I tend to go for brighter colors that would look good, you know, blooming, you know, like the apricots or something like that. Oh, but yeah. another thing to think about is like all of these reds and the reds and whites. I mean, they'll be blooming around like Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh. which is a special yeah. treat for somebody. Yeah, that is a special treat. Okay, so now let's talk about as the show comes to a close. So what should I do as the flowers start to fade? So amaryllis, like Val has been talking about, they can send up multiple stalks and then on each stalk, there can be multiple flowers. So let's talk about a stalk and let's say one of the flowers on that stalk has faded, but there's still other flowers on that stalk. What does someone do in that situation? And then once all the flowers on a given stalk have faded, what should someone do? Okay. That's another great question. Um, the thing to kind of keep in mind is that you don't want that bulb trying to expend any resources or energy on something that's past its prime. So as each flower fades and when it starts not looking that great, snap it off. That's because you don't want that bulb trying to keep that bloom in bloom when it's already fading. So just, I just snap it off. And then when all of the blooms on one stalk are gone, then yes. I cut that stalk off right above the base of the bulb. Again, I don't want that bulb spending any time on trying to keep that stalk green. You know, that doesn't matter. Yes. And, and it looks yes. too. And so um, then when all of the stems are, are done and they're all cut off, 
then um, it's probably already sending up leaves to, to rejuvenate itself, like you've mentioned. And so if that, if that were around like March, maybe in the house, what I would do is I would move that, that bulb, that container to the sunniest spot I have in my house. And I would water it a little bit when it's dry and I would just keep it happy until I can move it outside for the summer. Because if you want to try to get your amaryllis to rebloom, they need to rejuvenate themselves in the summer, like you've already mentioned. Yes, perfect. And that was the second half of the question was, after it is completely done blooming, should I throw the bulb away? No, don't do that. <laughs> or can I save it to rebloom next year? And you're just describing that. So after you have gone ahead and moved it outside, once it's warm enough, what sun conditions should you give that plant? Does it like full sun, full shade, or part sun? It does not like full shade because what you're going to do in the summertime is recharge that bulb. And remember that, you know, they come from a warm climates and where I see them growing in Texas, in Florida, they are in full sun to partial yeah. sun. And so I tend to keep mine out on the side of the house that uh, gets shade in the afternoon. And the reason I do that is because it's convenient for me. And so that's why I put it yes. there. I keep them in the pot that I had them in. You can also pull that bulb out and put it in the ground. You know, don't plant it more than, you know, keep half of that bulb out of the soil, but you mm -hmm. can also just sink it into the soil in your garden. And that is easier actually to kind of maintain because you don't have to worry about the, the uh, pot drying out. And so you water it, you, you know, don't, you don't want it to dry out. Um, and you, you want it to send up lots and lots of leaves all summer long. And they are big strapping leaves because that's what's going to get that bulb back to being a great big bulb. Because mm, after it yeah. sends up four stems, what started out as, you know, this great big bulb like this is going to be collapsed because you know, it's yes. all the babies are gone. And so you want to treat it in the summer so that it, it is happy and it grows lots and lots of leaves. And then that's, what's going to create this great big bulb. Yeah. You, you want, it, you want it to photosynthesize all summer and store yeah. up this energy in the bulb to create a huge show the next year. Lisa, do you tend to save your bulbs? Yes. And, um, you know, I was so fortunate years ago to hear a story from um, a girl, a lady who she had an amaryllis bulb that actually belonged to her grandmother. And it had been passed down from her, from her grandma to her mom. And then when her mom passed, she got it. And that started my whole journey of big bulbs because they are easier, I think, to save and winter over when they're larger and more mature. And um, yeah, so that's always fueled us. And I know a lot of people that actually have started that family tradition. And um, yeah, we love, my mother-in-law has every amaryllis she has ever been gifted with um, <laughs> and her sister. And so it was a little contest they had going on. And they are, I mean, I think- you know, we feel like they need all this fussy care, but in fact, they're really pretty easy. Yeah, they are. really pretty easy. They are. They're, they are. A, really, a really good way, I think, to keep them even is to have them in a great big clay pot because yes. they will, I mean, they'll start making little babies. The babies will get oh, bigger yeah. and pretty soon you've got a whole pot full. And somebody, just like you're talking about, Lisa, I was doing a talk and a woman came up to me and she had to be well into her 80s. And so she sent me a Polaroid picture of a great big container that her family had from like her aunt or her mother. And they kept those amaryllis in one great big pot and it would get more and more blooms every year. And then every every so often, I don't know how often, they would actually just kind of divide it up and they'd give you know, a big pot full to each of the family members and then they could grow oh. it on too. Oh, that's so that, cute. That's, a, that's pretty sweet. That is great. That's really that's like having that is Irish great. from a great grandmother or something. Yeah. Like and awesome. when you when you do give them those conditions, you will see that bulb getting bigger. It will start to make babies. I have one that I was just potting up 
I tend to take mine from the indoors, whatever pot they're in, and I'll put it in a different pot, like an outdoor only pot for the whole summer. And the one I just brought back in, it has five little babies going on all around it. So when you give them the right conditions, they will multiply. <laughs> all right. So next question. So let's say someone did put their amaryllis outside for the summer. So when should they let it go dormant? Why does it need to go dormant? And how should they encourage it to go dormant? And then does the desired bloom time impact when you let it go dormant? So let's say you really, really want blooms for Christmas. Do you need to force that into dormancy earlier than it naturally might want to go into it? Yes, you do. And I'll start with that question um, because when you really want them to be blooming is going to impact when you're going to bring them inside so they start their dormant period. And amaryllis have to have eight to 10 weeks of a dormant period where they are someplace darker, like not in the sun. And then also they can be a little bit cooler too, but the key is you never water them during that dormant period. And so when you, when you force them into dormancy, you're going to cut off all of those leaves and then you're going to bring them inside. Um, if it's still in a pot, that's fine. Leave it in the pot. I don't transplant them every year or every several years. I keep them in the same pot, but I cut off all the leaves. I bring them inside. I put them for us. I put them into our basement, which is kind of an old house basement where it's a tiny bit cooler, uh, and they, they are not in any light and I do not water them for at least eight to 10 weeks. Wow. So, um, if somebody wanted to have them for the holidays, you know, try to force them again for the holidays, um, you're just going to have to work backwards and probably about August is when you are going to stop watering. It's still going to have all those big leaves on it, but you're going to cut off all the leaves and you're going to bring that bulb inside. If you had planted it in the ground, just pull it up from the ground, put it in a paper bag and then put it in your closet or something like that. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm a lazy gardener and I, and I'm kind of busy this time of year. And so I don't try to have them blooming for the holidays. The ones that I say, I like blooming in February. And so I wait for the frost to hit the leaves. And when that happens, you know, I want the leaves to get as much energy to rejuvenate as possible. I yes. leave them on as long as I can. When the frost hits them, those leaves collapse because they are not happy. So I just cut them all off and uh, I just bring them into the basement and leave That's them. Awesome. Off. Don't cheat, water them. I had a friend yeah. that did that and she felt bad for them. And so <laughs> she watered hers that were supposed to be dormant. And when they're dormant is when they are creating all those great big bloom buds because you've got a big bulb. It's going to go to work creating all those little babies. When you water it, it's going to, it's not going to pay attention to creating babies. It's going to try to send up more leaves. You know, it's going to wow. try to do something like that. In fact, somebody yeah. just emailed me yesterday and they had forgotten to cut off the leaves when they brought theirs in. She said, some of them are still green. It's like that poor bulb has been trying to save its leaves versus create buds. <laughs> you don't yeah. want that. cut everything off. Don't water it so it has nothing to think about but making babies. <laughs> this is one of those cases where knowing the whole story really pays off. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, I do the same thing as you, Val. I tend to leave them outside as long as possible to soak up all that sun and store all that energy for next year's show. So I leave them out for a very long time until they get knocked back the same as you. Yep. And that's also why I was mentioning when we were talking about varieties to keep in mind the color for the next year that it's going to be blooming, not just this year, because for us, we have a very long growing season. So I, it was just a few weeks ago that I brought mine in. So mine are not going to be blooming for several months from now. So I have to think about that when I'm selecting my colors, what colors will I want to see at that time of year? All right, so you kind of just talked about this, but how do I store my dormant bulb? Do I leave it in the pot with soil or do I take it out? And you just said, you can leave it in, you can take it out, it's up to you. It doesn't make, I've tried it, you know, I've done it both ways. Do what is easiest for you. Yes. All right, so my amaryllis <laughs> had a baby. 
So should I divide the bulb or should I leave the little bulblet attached? And if I do want to divide it, when should this be done? So what do you tend to do when your amaryllis have babies? I leave the bulblet attached. I don't, I don't uh, take them off. Um, you can't, I, I have somebody, you know, I, I have somebody who's come to our workshops that likes to take it off and then she wants to grow it on, but it takes years for that little bulblet to form a big enough bulb that would actually bloom. And so I, I yeah. tend to just leave them on. I don't take them off. I don't either. And, you know, it just is one more example of why amaryllis bulbs cost so much. <laughs> it's like right up there with lint and rose babies. It's like they are <laughs> such slow growers that people are, you know, so surprised by the prices sometimes, but it's like somebody has had to care for, move, treat, and whatever this for years. Yeah. Um, so yeah. no, I never removed them. I just left them on and went on about my business. That's exactly what it's easier just to leave them on mm -hmm. while they're still in that young stage. Yeah. Yeah. And so some of the ones I'm potting up, um, they have babies coming up on the sides. And so um, uh, I like that because it sends up like their own little thing of leaves. And that's, yeah. they are, for some reason, they remind me like of a baby giraffe. I don't know why that is, but they just <laughs> send up little leaves next to their mama who has great big leaves. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. cute. All right. So now let's talk about gifting amaryllis. So what stage of growth do you think makes the best gift? And then also, I'm just curious, what's your favorite time of year to have amaryllis blooming in your personal home? Um, the stage of growth, and that's going to come down to how convenient it is for you to transport it to whoever you're giving it to, or for them to transport it home. And that's, that's going to be when it's not in big full bloom, right? Probably because they can tend to damage some of the flowers, you know, cause they'll set it on their seat and then it's up against the back of the seat. And then that can just cause a little bit of, of bruising on the flowers. But we actually, um, when I am delivering a, uh, bulb garden, that's got three bulbs in it. I love to have one starting to open. So that the person getting it, I mean, they are just so excited because then they see what it is. Yeah. Uh, but that's because we're really careful about transporting them in in our car. And anybody can do that, you know, just put it someplace where it's not going to get damaged. And that's kind of my tips on that, I guess. You know, uh, yeah. because if you break a stem and they aren't very developed yet, there's just not a lot of options. So, yeah. I mean, the, uh, I was going to say for us, when we were used to, I've sold them in many different ways. We sold them at markets, we shipped them, we've done all the ways. And I'm telling you, we like to move them before they start growing. You know, we like to sell them dormant um, because that allows them to get where they're going, to get settled in before they have to start putting on the yeah. the show and less stress. And that's not necessarily the best for a gift for somebody to receive, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's the best in the long run. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you grow several amaryllis and if you do like I do and plant them into these plastic, you know, six inch pot, and then when you want to make a gift for somebody, you look at them and you're looking at all the different ones at different stages and you get to choose, you know, what you yeah. want in the pot. And yeah. I like for people to see, you know, to see what it's going to look like and then to see what's coming on. I mean, what's it's so coming. exciting when they see other stems coming up. Yeah. Yeah. That's very fun. I think the anticipation, even if you're giving it to a kid and maybe you've let it break dormancy so they don't have to wait that whole time period, but yeah. they get to anticipate, they get to see it growing from the very bottom and get so tall. Kids love them. And it's not oh, just yeah. kids. My father-in-law, who was not really a guard, you know what I mean? Not a flower guy. You know what I mean? He would call me and say, it grew an inch since yesterday morning. <laughs> you know, he was watching it. And so, yeah, they're very, very exciting. I mean, we loved providing those to people um, with how to grow them. It was awesome. Families do that. And they will like somebody will give one to each of their siblings or to each of their aunts. And then it becomes a competition. Yep. You know, like 
which one's doing the most, the fastest, but it, 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 um, gives them some, gives them a lot to talk about. Exactly. Which is what a lot of people need at that stage in life. Yes. 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 For and sure. Do you have a favorite time of year that you like to have them blooming in your house? Like for me, I actually really love having them bloom in January or February, kind of after all the holidays have gone by. Do you have a favorite time of year that you like to have them blooming? I'm exactly like you, Lane. I love for them to be blooming because I don't, I don't keep house plant. I don't keep a lot of house plants in the house. Um, I, I love cyclamen. So I have cyclamen in there uh, blooming. Oh yeah. But, um, I love them blooming when it's, you know, when you look outside and you're thinking, when is spring ever going to come? And that's when I think that they, they make you the happiest and if your house tends to be a little bit cooler in the winter, that makes these even last longer too. Yeah. How about you, Lisa? I am so very much the same. I mean, oh. we used to love to sell, is it North that's later Northern hemisphere? Yes. Yes. We used to love doing the North. I mean, people would think, oh, they're going to bloom for Christmas. It's like, no, there's enough going on at Christmas these babies are going to like wide open the end of January, February. Um, and that was the most spectacular show. I think people sometimes were a little disappointed at the beginning, but once the show started, they were so happy to have them at that time of the year. And once they know what to expect after that first year, they are hooked. Oh. Yeah. Yes. They're hooked. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. All sure. right, so we're we're on to the last question. So, where can someone learn more about forcing bulbs and creating indoor displays, and how can they connect with you, Val? Well, I would say that um, the course that I did uh, for the gardeners workshop is um, the best way. I think that's it's a great way to learn how to do this because I video. I didn't videotape. I I taped myself throughout the process, you know, yeah, actually growing these and saving them and how I use them. Uh, and so for, for 50 bucks, you know, you can, you can learn everything about how to do that. Yes. As well as where to purchase them. Um, if yeah. you're a home gardener and even commercial resources mm -hmm. for flower farmers that want to do it. And seeing your gardens, and when we say garden, y'all, we're talking about containers that mm -hmm. she uses to make these, to put these bulbs in it. And it is just, it is spectacular. So yeah, so you can, it's forcing glorious blooms for the holidays and beyond. And I'm sure that Lane will put in the show notes, a link directly to that. It's $49.95. And um, if you're not familiar with our courses, once you purchase it, it's just like buying a book, y'all. You can pick it up anytime and rewatch it. You just log into your online library and it's right there. And if you have unlimited lifetime access. So if you get it this year and you do it, you don't have to remember everything because guess what? You can just watch it again next August or September when you're thinking, all right, now I know that I want to order my bulbs earlier to get the big ones and to get all my supplies. Um, and Val, as a commercial person, you actually order your bulbs like in like January and February, right? For yes. the next yep. year to get yep. the big ones. So that's a great tip for commercial growers. Yeah. Because the great yeah. big bulbs are multi, they're, 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 they're not one or two years old. I mean, they are, they've been around for a while and it used to be that the size bulbs that I get are, you know, only 2% of the amaryllis in the world are that size. And now since COVID, I think it's, it's less than 2%. Yes. Yes. So, um, but people could go online, uh, you know, just Google and you, there's retail sources where you could actually get probably on sale, maybe some, some great big bulbs and give yeah. it a shot. This year. Yeah. Cause that would be a fun thing for somebody to give the course as a Christmas gift, and then also have a couple bulbs coming for the person. Yes. yes. I was, I was going to suggest that too, because the course is giftable. And like Val said, it's just a really fun course to watch. It's Val. She's outdoors in her greenhouse <laughs> or indoors, and she's got all these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful displays and just prepare yourself because you will want to buy <laughs> 
some amaryllis bulbs after watching her course. <laughs> but it's how, true. It's true. It is true. So how can people connect with you, Val, on social media? Or- sure. On social media, it's either Three Toads Farm or Val Shermer. And um, my personal Instagram is full of flowers, full of horse racing. Maybe you got a Bloody Mary mixed in once in a while too. <laughs> and then, uh, and and I love to connect with people. They reach out to me. They ask me questions, uh, what to do. And then same thing with Facebook. It's Three Toads Farm or Valerie Shermer. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Val, and sharing all this information. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Val and Lane. Thank Thanks you. to both of you. This has been all fun. Right. Yeah, friends this is so fun. Till we meet again, friends. Ciao. Bye. Bye.